God. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's always interesting to me when I'm at a party or social gathering where people don't know that I am a pastor. I get talking to folks, the normal small talk kind of stuff, and the food is served and the drinks are poured and everybody's having a good time. Then comes the inevitable question, what do you do for a living? I usually take a deep breath before responding, oh, I'm a pastor. The response to this information is always fascinating and very rarely neutral and tends to fall into one of three categories. Probably the most common response is surprise. I am not what they uh, know and imagine pastors to be like. I am not old enough, not male enough, not straight enough, or surprise because they expect pastors to be more straight-laced than I have shown myself to be in our conversation. Sometimes this surprise leads to confusion. I didn't know someone like you could be a pastor. Sometimes to intrigue or even excitement. I didn't know someone like you could be a pastor. The second common response is for people to apologize. It is a response of shame. If they had known I was a pastor, they wouldn't have talked so openly about something or other that they perceived to be wrong or bad. They wouldn't have cursed. They wouldn't have whatever. There is a fear that I have judged them, or at the very least that they have offended my pastorly sensitivities. The third common response, less common but still happens from time to time, is to open up, often about their own history with the church. Sometimes this takes the form of confession. I should really go back to church. Or sometimes it's about their frustration and anger with religious institutions and people. Less often, people will open up about something serious that's going on in their lives, illness, grief, so on. These responses are telling, not only about people's perceptions of pastors, but more broadly about the barriers that divide us. Religion, age, gender, sexual orientation, are all differences that can become barriers dividing people. Of course, these are just a few. There's also race and ethnicity, political persuasion, social status, economic status, generational differences, education, physical and intellectual differences in ability, and I'm sure many more that I'm missing. These differences are not inherently bad, but we as human beings have a tendency to turn them into barriers, dividing people into groups of us and them, inside and outside, good and bad, and creating hostility, conflict, and even violence between us. I invite you to think for a moment about your own experiences of barriers between people. Times when you've been on the inside or outside of a group and what that felt like. Maybe you have been new to a country or state or town or neighborhood. Maybe you've been excluded from participating in something based on your age or gender. Maybe others have perceived you a certain way and have been hostile towards you because of your social status or your politics or your education, whether their perceptions are accurate or not. And whether or not we like to admit it or maybe even realize it, there are barriers and hostilities that we play a part in upholding too. Times when we keep people at arm's length or judge or assume things about them based on their membership in a particular group. 
A few years ago, I was at a staff lunch at our annual conference, and it was one of those events where they seat you with people that you don't usually work with so that you get to know each other. It's kind of team building kind of thing. We were supposed to be sharing about our lives, and I was seated at a table with this big, tall, broad, older man who worked in finances. And I was so apprehensive about having to have this conversation with him because I was worried about what his reaction would be when I mentioned Jen, who was my fiance at the time, expecting that he might be disapproving or judgmental or at least respond awkwardly. Well, I forgot, forget exactly what I said, maybe something to the effect of my fiance and I have plans to go visit my parents for a long weekend, something like that. And I waited for his response with bated breath. And when it came, it was something to the effect of, oh, my husband and I are traveling this weekend too. I felt so relieved but also embarrassed that I had gone into the conversation with assumptions about him. And the point isn't that everything was okay because we have something in common. The point is that I went into the conversation on guard and defensive because of certain characteristics that this man had. And if I hadn't been forced to do this team building exercise, might I have always avoided him with a little trepidation? How often do we do that? Our scripture reading today speaks to this issue of barriers that divide us and create hostility among us. We read from this same book last week, which is Paul's letter to likely several church communities in the area of Ephesus. And we learned, that last, and we learned last week that these church communities were likely facing pressure from the outside in the form of persecution under the Roman Empire, as well as conflict and division within, between Jewish and Gentile, or non-Jewish, follower, followers of Jesus, or members of the church. This is a conflict that shows up again and again in the book of Acts and in the letters that are included in the New Testament because of the way that the church was formed. Jesus was Jewish. Yahweh, the God of Israel, was his God and Father. And he followed in the line of the prophets of the people of Israel, upholding their scriptures, their faith, and their stories. The disciples with which Jesus surrounded himself during his earthly life were all Jewish, coming to understand Jesus as the Messiah, the one who their people had been waiting for to bring freedom and liberation after centuries of political turmoil. The first Christians were Jewish. And it is through the expansive vision of God's love and grace that through Jesus, the God of the people of Israel was introduced to those outside of the Jewish faith, to Gentiles. It is through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit that the God of Israel was revealed to be the God of all. As our scripture reading today puts it, remember that, remember that you, that is Gentiles, were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And later, Jesus came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, that is again, the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, that is the people of Israel or the Jewish people. For through him, both of us, Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit to the Father. And so it is because the early church was a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles, groups who had previously been divided by their religions and cultures, that this theme of internal conflict comes up over and over again in the early church, as we see in the New Testament. They had to work out what it meant to be in community together, as people who were in many ways so different. Much of the time when this is addressed in scripture, it is about the Jewish followers of Jesus not holding the Gentiles to the, to the standards of Judaism, 
Standards like circumcision or following rules about what foods are considered clean and unclean. It is about encouraging the Jewish followers of Jesus to recognize the same spirit at work in Gentiles, even without following these traditions and building community based on that same shared spirit. But our scripture today seems to be addressed primarily to Gentile followers of Jesus. So some scholars suggest that the conflict in this case was not about Jewish Christians holding Gentile Christians to the standards of the Jewish faith. Rather, it was about the Gentile Christians alienating their Jewish Christian brothers and sisters within the church. Isn't that a sad possibility? that those who had been brought in, graciously grafted into a faith and a history that was not originally theirs, now turn around and alienate those whose faith and history they had been brought into. Sadly, it is not a possibility that ended at the time of the church, but we, at the time of the New Testament, but we still see that happening today with anti-Semitism in our church and in the world. And so in our reading today, Paul is calling the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, in the Ephesus churches, to remember that they had once been outsiders and that they had been brought into relationship with God and to this community. Not so that they could turn the tables so that they could become the insiders and make the Jewish people to be the outsiders, They'd been brought in not so that they could feel a sense of superiority over anyone or a sense of ownership over Jesus or the church, but rather so that all of them together would be made one new humanity, at peace with one another and at peace with God. He calls them to remember who they are, no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, built on the foundation of the Jewish faith, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The unwritten but implied message here is, so act like it. Remember that by grace alone you are citizens and members of the household of God, so act like it. And Paul illuminates something else for us about our human divisions and hostilities. He says that on the cross, Jesus put hostility to death so that peace could be proclaimed to all. This tells us that hostility and all the things that lead to it are sinful. In other words, hostility and all the things that lead to it are a turning away from God. Indeed, it was hostility and hatred that put Jesus on the cross. And in being raised from the dead, Jesus proclaimed that hostility and hatred could not win over God's love. That we might know peace not only with God, but with one another. And so when we maintain hostilities, when we create and uphold barriers that divide people one from the other, and especially when we do so in the name of religion or in the name of Christ, we are acting in contradiction to the purpose of God in sending Jesus to live, die, and be raised for us. We are trying to build build walls where God has definitively torn them down. And not only do we hurt and harm those on the other side of those barriers, but we also hurt and harm ourselves by rejecting the gifts of grace, reconciliation, and community that Jesus offers to us. But there is hope. Part of that hope lies in repentance. And that is a religious word we like to throw around, and especially to shout from corners at people who do things that we don't like. But it is a word that is spoken also and most importantly to each of us and what it means is turn around make a change of mind and heart 
turn around from the hostility and the divisiveness and turn towards God. God has made you a citizen of God's kingdom, a kingdom without borders and barriers, so act like it. It is not easy to do this because the, the divisions between us help us to feel safe and secure. When we are around people who act, think, and look like us, we get to feel right and we get to feel unchallenged. To reach across the barriers can be uncomfortable and painful and awkward. But beyond those growing pains or reaching pains across the barriers is a peace that is so worth it. And so my friends, I call you this week to be aware of the barriers that exist in our communities. Barriers of race, of politics, of wealth, just a few examples. Reflect on how you may perhaps unintentionally help to keep these barriers in place. And consider how instead you can actively help to break them down. Maybe it is in advocating for immigrants, fighting racism, or engaging in conversa kind conversation with someone across the political aisle. As we prepare to come to the table of communion today, may we remember that we are all there by the grace of God. May we each be fed by that grace, remembering that for everyone born, there's a place at the table. And may we become agents of grace, extending the invitation to sit at it as it has first been extended to us. Amen. Nick will play.